Good morning. We're in a series on the book of Hebrews, and the series is entitled, Who is Jesus? And we've been looking for a handful of weeks, and today we're in chapter 5. So if we can have everyone stand up for the reading of the word, we're going to read chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he also says in another passage, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became to all of those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Thank you. You may be seated. We are a Bible-believing, note-taking church, so grab your pens, your notepads, and let's begin. Uh, Last week, I pointed out Hebrews chapter 13, verse 21, as the ultimate end of the writer of Hebrews. And it reads that God, uh, may the God of peace equip you in every good thing to do God's will. So this is the God's ultimate goal and and where he's trying to bring us. So all of these weeks are designed to teach us who Jesus is and to understand and be equipped so that we will, at the end, be those who are will-doers. So a quick review. Uh, We'll look at uh, how Jesus, the high priest, has equipped us. In chapter 1, we saw that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature. And the thing he did to equip us was that he purifies us from our sins. Chapter 2, we saw that Jesus is the one who has conquered death and he has taken the power of death away from the devil. And the way that he equips us is that he removes the fear of death from us. Furthermore, it says he is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. So Jesus, the high priest, equips us by removing shame from us. If you have any shame, you can go back and listen to a sermon I preached here on June 18th on Father's Day. We'll help you understand that even more. Chapter 3, we saw Jesus is the builder. And um, chapter 4 was last week, we saw Jesus the high priest. And this high priest does something with the Word of God. The Word of God is living, active, and sharper than any two-edged sword. And he cuts as the high priest. We get up on the altar. Some of us need to get up on the altar. We get up on the altar and we permit Jesus, the high priest, to go down to the very core of our being. That can be frightening, but I'm here to tell you it's worth the pain. It's worth going through that. In the future, next week, we'll see Jesus, the foundation. After that, we'll see Jesus is the one who perfects our conscience. Jesus is the one who intercedes before us. He's at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Chapter 8, we're going to see that Jesus writes the word of God on our heart. And then we'll see that chapter 12, 11 and 12, that Jesus is the one who perfects our faith. So we're looking at who is Jesus. This is who he is. And each one of these aspects of Jesus is perfecting us and maturing us and equipping us so that we'll go out and be will doers. He is not interested in us just coming here and singing. He is interested in that, but he's not just interested in that. He's interested in us going out day by day, living out, demonstrating what the invisible God looks like by doing his will. So we have to have that as the aim and the goal, the ultimate goal for what uh, the writer of Hebrews is trying to do. So today we're going to look at uh, Hebrews, start with Hebrews 5, verses 5 and 6. So Christ did not glorify himself to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you, just as he says in another passage, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek, like, who is Melchizedek? I mean, Melchizedek is in the Old Testament. There's four verses about Melchizedek. There's only four verses. We're going to discover in chapter 7 that Melchizedek is the greatest 
of everyone in the Old Testament. Because the Bible says he's greater than Abraham, and he was greater than Levi. And Levi, that's because Levi was inside of Abraham. Moses was inside of Abraham. So Melchizedek was greater than Moses. David was inside of Abraham. So Melchizedek is greater than David. Elijah was inside of Abraham. So therefore, Melchizedek was greater than Elijah. So we have this mysterious figure called Melchizedek. And like, who is he? Four verses. The greatest man in the Old Testament. Four verses. I mean, it's astonishing. And what we have to know regarding the Old Testament is the Old Testament is filled with prophetic foreshadows and types. And so God, seeing that Jesus would be high priest, needed the foreshadow. So he creates a guy called Melchizedek. And we don't know anything about him. He doesn't have mother, father, doesn't seem to die. And it's because the foreshadow had to portray who Jesus is without beginning or end. And so we have this strange person, Melchizedek. And the thing about him was two, two things about him. He is a priest and he's also king, which means he's royalty. And so Jesus Christ is the king of kings and he is also the great high priest according to this order of Melchizedek, and Jesus is royalty, okay? He is a royal priest. Now, that's important because of our next verse we're going to look at. Uh, we're going to look at, uh, well, before we get there, there's a problem, and I need to talk about this problem. The problem is that Jesus was not of the tribe of Levi. Now, for those of you not familiar with the Old Testament, there was a man named Israel, and Israel has 12 sons. And these 12 sons become what we call the 12 tribes of Israel. And they go on and they become the nation of God. And God selects one tribe. He selects the tribe of Levi, and he says, you guys are the priests, and the rest of you are not. As a matter of fact, it's forbidden for you if you're not of Levi, to act as a priest. So we have this big problem because Jesus was the lineage of David, the son of David, which was the tribe of Judah. What do we do? John, what do we do to solve this problem? Well, the problem gets solved when Jesus is raised from the dead and, and God the Father says, you are a priest according, not to Levi, but according to the order of Melchizedek problem is solved. And we see that Melchizedek was greater than Levi. So therefore, Jesus is greater than Levi and great, his priesthood is greater than that of the Levitical priesthood. Okay, now you're like, okay, that's all great Bible knowledge. What am I going to do with this? And so uh, we're going to turn now to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at how this applies to us. First, first Peter chapter 2, verse 9. For we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're a priesthood. Did you know that you are a priesthood? Did you know that you're a priest before God? What does that mean? Ooh, I'm a priest. No, you're not. You're a royal priest. What's that mean? What do you think that means for you? What does that mean? Well, let's look at what that means. What do priests do? I have three primary things that priests do. First, priests offer sacrifices to God. And we'll see this in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 where it says that we let us therefore continually offer up a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of our lips that give thanks to his name. We just did that for about 30 minutes. And hopefully throughout the week you're doing that. You're offering to God a sacrifice of your lips. Father, I thank you today. I wake up in the morning. Thank you, Father, for giving me a good night's sleep. Thank you today for my breakfast. Thank you for my food. Thank you for the house I live in. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my family. I begin to thank him. Even when things are difficult, even when I'm in a valley, I begin to thank him. It's a sacrifice of thanks, a sacrifice of praise. There are times when everything is great. I love those times, mountaintops. 
It's easy to praise him. But what happens when you're in the valley? We have to offer a sacrifice of praise, and we're doing it by faith because we're seeing what is going to be. It's not yet, but we're seeing by faith. And whoever preaches in the Hebrews 11 is going to get a great opportunity to talk about that. But number two, we represent people to God. This is what priests do. God's in heaven and we're like, Father, I'm, I'm a priest and I lift up my brothers and sisters to you. I'm representing them to you. Would you have mercy upon them? Would you have mercy upon my, my brother who is going astray? Bring him back into the flock. I pray for those that are unsaved. God, would you open their hearts? I'm representing people to God. I'm interceding for them. That's what we are to do. And then thirdly, uh, we, are, we represent God to the people. You know, Sam Best preached uh, a year ago. It was a really great sermon. And he talked about we open our mouth and we speak to God. And then we open our ears. We listen. Then we hear. And then we do something with what we hear. So I pray for my brothers and sisters. I'm listening. I'm listening. I don't always hear something. But sometimes I hear something. And then we go and speak. Last fall, I had a prophetic dream. It was a dream about the pastors here. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this. So I pray for them daily already. But I had a prophetic dream and I prayed for four more months. I wanted to know precisely what should I say or should I even say anything. Maybe God's just giving me this dream just to intercede more. Don't know. So after about four months, I had lunch with Andrew, and I just shared this. It was a word of encouragement. I wasn't rebuking him. It wasn't like, I'm correct. I've got the word of God, and you don't, and you're really missing it. I mean, that's even if he was really missing it, that would not be the attitude. But what am I saying? As a priest, I worship God. As a priest, I pray for one another. As a priest, I listen. And then sometimes, once in a while, I speak on God's behalf. You all are royal priests. There is a new priesthood. And God is raising up people of faith. People who have been equipped. People who no longer are fearful of death. People who have had their sins washed by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. People who have had the fear of death removed and had the shame removed and put into them a boldness and a faith and a confidence that you're not just a servant, but you're a son or you're a daughter. And then to pray with faith and call out to the living God as priest and sometimes to receive a message from God and to be the voice of God to people. That's who we are. Week by week, someone stands up here and does that. I believe today I'm here with a message from God representing him to you, representing his heart to you, his word to you. But the big deal is not so that just someone up here can once a week do that, but that day by day. This is why in Hebrews 3.13 it says, Therefore, day by day, as long as it's still called day, encourage one another. We're to hear his voice and speak on his behalf. So let's now zero in on another aspect of, of priesthood or elaborate on one of those uh, aspects, which is the aspect of prayer. And we're going to look at Hebrews 5, 7 through uh, 9 again. And we're talking about Jesus. And this is talking about in the Garden of Gethsemane. So Jesus has had the final supper. He said all these wonderful things, many of which are, are written in John 13, 14, 15, 16. And then he goes into this garden and he prays. It's right before the hours before he's betrayed. It says, in the day of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud cryings and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been, having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of salvation. And so I want to talk briefly about two kinds of prayers. You know, we often talk about our quiet time. It's like, how's your quiet time going? 
I mean, I hear this all the time. Like, how are you doing? How's your quiet time going? And what we mean by that is, how's your devotional life? You're reading the word, you're praying, you're talking to God. And it's a one form, it's a valid form of prayer. But there's another kind of prayer that's talked about here. It's our loud time. Do you have a loud time with God? How's your loud time? Next time someone says, how's your quiet time? Say, great, how's your loud time? Let me tell you about my loud time. How's your loud time? Some of us need to have a loud time. Some of us haven't broken through to our loud time. Some of us don't know that we're permitted to have our loud time. Jesus taught us this. When you pray, be like the widow. Be like the insistent widow that goes, goes before the judge. Like, I demand, I demand justice. And this judge is like, yeah, whatever, go away. She comes back, I demand justice. Now, one thing about this woman, she knew what the law said, meaning she knew what the word of God promised. If you don't know what the word of God promised, you don't know what justice you deserve. You're not going to be bold like her. But the other example we're going to look at, Luke 11, verses 5 through 8. Jesus, when teaching on prayer, he says, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to his friend, Lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come from a journey, and I don't have anything to set before him. And from inside, this friend says, Ah, don't bother me. The door's already shut. I'm in bed. I'm in my pajamas or worse. Don't bother me. I'm in bed. We can't get, I can't get up and give you anything. And Jesus says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he's his friend, because of your persistence, you're, he will get up and give you whatever. This is the loud time prayer. There, we are invited by Jesus to be loud before God in prayer. I'm going to illustrate this in a minute. We're going to look at a verse I did not look at last week from Hebrews 4, the last three verses of chapter 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in all things and yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence. Let us draw near with what? Confidence. To the throne of grace, not to the throne of judgment, to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Come to him with boldness. Don't be afraid to raise your voice. There may be times when the answer is no. Jesus had that. When Jesus got on his face, it says he fell on his knees. And he put his face to the, fir to the ground and he cried out, Father, if it's your will, all things are possible. Let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but yours. And Jesus surrendered to, to the will of the Father. So let me tell you, when I was 22, I lived at home. I had gone to Purdue three years, then I went to seminary for a year in California. I came home for the summer. I'm the youngest of four. My home life was not very pleasant. Mom was an alcoholic, drunk every night. My dad was a rageaholic. And so I didn't see him drunk very often. But in the middle of the summer, and I'm pursuing God with all my heart. I mean, I work, I come home, I would read my Bible an hour or two. I'm making notes, I'm reading church history. I'm doing all this stuff outside of theological classes. I was pursuing God with all my heart. And so I'm pursuing God. And, but what you need to know about me is I was very meek and timid. The man that you guys know today is the exact opposite of who I was at age 22. Never confronted if I got an embarrassing situation or a shameful situation, I would just kind of cower. And so mom was drunk this night and I get a phone call from dad and he's like, I'm going to be home in about 50 minutes and um, dinner better be ready. Well, I could tell dad was drunk and I'm, it was an OMG moment. Like what is going to happen? I go upstairs I get on my knees before the Lord and I begin to cry out with a loud time prayer. Father, I need your help, oh God. 
Just as I started, I pushed the little, I had this new digital watch, 1977. I mean, it was brand new. There was never such a thing. And I pushed the button. I saw the time because I needed to know when dad was going to get there. And I began to cry out, Father, I need your help. Oh, God, come to my aid. I need you, Lord. Dad's going to come home. It's going to be awful. He's drunk. And I begin to pray in the spirit and I intercede. And I'm, and I'm, I'm down like this, calling out with all my might, praying and praying and praying. And I thought I had prayed for about five minutes, and I, and I thought, I better check the time. And I pushed, and it was 45 minutes had gone by. But what had happened at the end of that 45 minutes was there was a click. There was, there was something in my heart that happened. A spirit of faith came. A grace of faith came. This confidence came. I knew that I knew that something good was going to happen. Well, I go downstairs, and five minutes later... Dad comes home, and he is drunk, and Mom is drunk. And, and you know, I know it was like, why don't you just leave? No, you, you're not permitted to do that in my home. So I'm trapped, sitting at this kitchen table, and the Holy Spirit said, you are going to be attacked, a hell, all hell is going to break loose, a firestorm from hell is going to break loose, and it's going to attack you, and the words are going to come at you, accusations and awful things attacking your person, attacking your identity, and I want you to just stand confident in me. I am with you. And so I sat there, and they started cussing and yelling and screaming at each other. And then they would turn to me, and they would say horrible things to me, and then horrible things to one another. And this goes on for an hour. And the Holy Spirit kept saying, don't answer them. Just give short, little, tiny answers. Don't take the bait. I am with you. And I had such a confidence. I had such a peace. It was awful what was being said. And then at the end of an hour, something happened. So, that wasn't a very good snap. I'm not very good at that. <laughs> something happened. I was going to clap my hand real loud, but it's kind of hard to do with the microphone here. Something happened. Something in the spirit realm broke. They stopped. It was as though they became sober. And all of a sudden, they looked at each other and they go... Why? They started laughing. Like, what are we doing arguing and yelling at each other and saying these horrible things? And they started laughing. Like, I don't know. Let's go to bed. Now, my parents didn't sleep in the same room. I mean, that's how awful their marriage was. And they go off to bed. It had been a full hour. I'm sitting at this kitchen table. I'm like, uh, did that really happen? I literally pinched my arm. Like, am I awake? Did I imagine that? Did I just dream that? Did that really happen? Friends, I'm telling you, we have a great high priest. We are priests. We are invited to come with boldness, with confidence. We are invited to come and say, Lord, yes. even though you won't get up and give me all I need, I need bread now. Get up. Get up, Lord. Get up. Get up. Get up, Lord. Have you ever had your loud time prayer? Yes. I worked UPS in Miami. Three years. Three years in a day. We used to have to get signatures. I knocked on a lot of doors. I had a callus on my knuckle. I discovered it was the left side of this middle knuckle. It's the one that actually hit the door. I had this big callus there. Do you have a callus on your knuckle? Do you have callus on your knees? We are a royal priesthood. The... Promises are amazing. John 15, 7. If my word is in you and your word is, if my word is in you and you are in my word, ask anything you want and it will be done for you. Do you believe that? You see, last week I talked about the children of Israel. And the children of Israel got right up to the promised land, right into the edge of the promised land. And they sent out spies and 10 of those spies came back. And they came back with a false report. And remember, I talked about the voice, and I talked about the distorted voice. I talked about the voice of the serpent in the Garden of Eden was distorted, and Eve believed it, and then she had a distorted voice. Adam listened to her voice. The voice of these ten spies was distorted. 
We could look at Peter. The same thing happened to him. Matthew 16, I'll just kind of reference it. Peter, uh, Jesus says, who am I? What do the people say? And he goes, oh, well, some say you're John the Baptist or Elijah, one of the great prophets. But you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus goes, way to go, Peter. You got it right. You were the pristine, pure voice of God the Father who's revealed that to you. Peter's feeling pretty good about himself. Moments later, Jesus is going, oh, by the way, uh, we're about to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be arrested. They're going to beat me. They're going to whip me. They're going to kill me. Peter's like, well, that ain't going to happen. That is not aligned with my theology. (laughs) See, Peter's spirit and soul had not yet been separated. And Peter was hearing the voice of what he thought was God through the filter of his mind and intellect. Sometimes we hear through the filter of our mind and reason and our theology. Sometimes we hear through the filter of our emotions. And God wants to separate that so that the spirit can speak to our spirit. And then Peter goes, that's not going to happen to you. And Jesus goes, get behind me, devil. Peter had no idea that he went from the voice of God the Father, pure and pristine, to like a completely distorted voice. So why am I telling this? Because God wants to separate our souls from our spirits so that we can hear clearly, so that when we pray for one another, we are going to have the pure voice of the Father for one another. That's part of our prayer. Now, there's a second kind of loud time prayer, which we see Jesus doing here. And it is the prayer not of insistence. That was a Luke 11, the prayer of insistence. It is the prayer of surrender, where we have to get on our knees and we have to have a a loud cry out to God. Oh, God, I need you to deliver me from this situation. Okay, I, you, in my sermon back in June, I talked about the abuse I suffered, and then God sends me to the man that had abused me. That was fun. And I'm praying, I'm like, God, just heal me from these things. All things are possible. I know that you can heal me. Just heal me. I don't need to go talk to him. And the Lord said, Go. No, I don't want to go, Lord. Just heal me. You can do it. You don't need to send me. And I prayed and I prayed. And finally, I realized that the Lord was saying, surrender to me. And I went. And you know what? The most marvelous healing has taken place. I don't recommend that you go and talk in those situations unless you are clearly directed by the Holy Spirit. Because... There are some people who are so evil, you will have a greater wound. So if you think you're going to do something like what I just described, make sure that you have friends who are praying for you. I did. The other thing is I hated my father. And I talked back in June about my brother wanting to murder my dad twice. And what my encouragement to Paul was do it. And so I'm on my knees again. This is we've moved back to Indiana I'm about 35 years old. I'm like, oh, God, would you change my dad? Would you save him, Lord? Would you help me be healed? I still hate this man. I'm a Christian. I'm a minister. I mean, like, I got problems. And he's like, go to your dad. I'm like, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Anything. I'll fast. I'll pray. I'll pray two hours. I mean, I begin bargaining with God. And he's like, no, go. So I went, and the Lord said, by the way, when you go, he's not going to agree with you. You're going to walk out of there feeling like a failure, feeling stupid. And I did. And he sent me again and again and again and again and again, very respectfully talking to my dad, very respectfully saying, Dad, these things happen as a child. Dad, these, we, I have these issues. We need to work through them. What God was doing was making me to be a man who was bold, removing timidity from me, and at the same time, softening dad's heart. And so after 24 years, he finally humbled himself, received Jesus. I water baptized him, fully restored relationship. Seven days later, he died. This is the power of surrender. If we can have our worship team come on up. 
God wants us as priests to have our quiet times prayer. And God wants us as priests to have our loud time prayers, the prayers of insistence and the prayers of surrender. If you have an area in your life that you believe God just, he just can't do it. You need to have the loud time prayer of, of insistence. And I want to invite you to come up here in just a minute. Can we all stand to our feet? Some of us need to have a prayer of surrender. Some here don't even know Jesus yet as Savior. And you need to come and surrender. Some of you know Jesus as Savior, but you've not surrendered key areas in your life. There's areas where you've not let go. You've not asked someone else to forgive you. Or you've not gone to them and said, I forgive you. Or even just in prayer, say, Father, I choose to forgive these people who did these things to me. There's some area you're holding on to your finances. You want to live your life your way. You want the blessings of God, but you don't want to surrender. And so we're going to have the prayer team come on up. We're going to have people up here to pray for you. And as they pray for you, realize that you're hearing the voice of, of God through their voice. They're, going to, they're priests. So let's bow our heads. Father, I'm asking right now. I'm asking right now, God, that you would, that you would do a mighty work, Lord in our hearts. Father, I'm praying right now. Listen, if you're here and you're like, I know he's talking to me. The preacher's talking to me. I want you to come up. Come on up now. The Lord wants to meet you just as I described how the Lord met me. Come on up. Come up for prayer. Father, I just ask that each situation that you will intervene, each situation you will show yourself strong, that you will make us to be people fully equipped to do your will. Make us to be priests according to the order of Melchizedek, Lord, where we step in right behind your son, Jesus, the great high priest, where we call out to you and hear your voice, Lord, and you move and act on our behalf. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.